Um, why don't we get started, guys? Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. Sorry if it booted everybody off here, but we're back on. Mike, you're, uh, you're up, man. Teach us uh, course one, the basic refrigeration cycle. So the key components needed in a basic refrigeration cycle are the compressor. Uh, can you see the scroll, the mouse going around? Yep. The compressor, uh, you have the condenser, the evaporator, and a metering device. It could be a flow rater, a TXV, anything that meters the refrigerant. The compressor is the heart of the system. It compresses the uh, low pressure refrigerant vapor from the evaporator and compresses it into a high uh, pressure vapor. Uh, inlet to the compressor is called the suction line and it brings a low pressure vapor into the compressor. A proper functioning compressor, compressor is usually cool or cold to the touch. After the compressor compresses refrigerant, into the high pressure vapor, it removes it to the outlet called the discharge line. Simple, simple. The discharge line leaves the compressor and runs to the inlet of the condenser because, and it's right in here to the inlet, because the refrigerant was compressed as a hot, high pressure vapor, as pressure goes up, temperature goes up, that's that correlation. The hot vapor enters a condenser and starts to flow through the tubes. The cool air is blown across the outside of the finned tubes of the condenser, usually by fan or water with a pump. Easy enough. Since the air is cooler than the refrigerant, heat jumps from the tubing to the cool air because energy goes from a hot to a cold and that is called latent heat. Sorry, Jim all of a sudden ended up in San Francisco and I, I didn't know what happened. I was like, wow, that dude is fast. Um, the high pressure liquid leaves the condenser through the liquid line. It travels to the metering device, sometimes running through a filter dryer to remove any dirt or foreign particles. Any questions about that? I have lots of handouts too, if you guys wanted to see a dryer cut open. Metering devices regulate how much liquid refrigerant enters the evaporator. Commonly used metering devices are cap tubes, which are small tubes that like to plug up. TXVs, thermal expansion, like the one I have here and the single opening orifice. The metering devices try to maintain a preset temperature difference or superheat between the inlet and outlet openings of the evaporator. As the metering devices regulates the amount of refrigerant going into the evaporator, the device lets a small amount of refrigerant out into the line. It loosens the high pressure and that it has behind it. I love this. This is a great drawing from the Sporlin. You got that from the Sporlin, Jim? Terrific drawing. Now we have low pressure, cooler liquid entering the evaporator coil. Pressure goes down and so does temperature. Hey, Mike, while, you, while you're on the slide, uh, forgive the beginner and me here to ask. I've heard uh, the term both TXV and EXV. Is there any difference or are they just different names? Well, I stepped away here, here in Arizona. I actually have an EXV. Um, this is like, if you're thinking about an electronic expansion valve, correct, Jim? So this is actually an EXV electronic expansion valve off of a 200 ton Daikin. Uh, my son gave this to me, but if you guys wanted to see it, this is an EXV. This is what it is to me. I could be wrong. And then this is an expansion valve. This is a thermal expansion valve that uses the pressure off of a power head to drive the valve open or closed. Fair enough? Yep. I'm looking at Jim, because Jim is, uh, 
Jim is the, uh, the refrigeration guru. Probably one of the best refrigeration techs I've ever met. Jim, any comment on the TXV, EXV? Like the EXV right here? This one actually went bad. I'm going to open it up so you guys can see it. This is a rebuildable EXV. It's much like what you guys would see in an OVE expansion valve where you can rebuild the guts. You can see the hollow. This is the valve body, the valve itself. This piece comes out and it's rebuildable. For the most part, it throttles and steps. It's like a stepper valve in your case, like on a refrigeration case. But this is what an EXV is. It's just a really big one. Okay, Nick? Yep. Can you hear me, Mike? And yeah. We talked a little bit about filter dryers on the original one. For the guys that are in the other branches, we cut one in half. Some of you are leaning forward. This is actually an ex a pancake dryer. You can see that this is a really bad burnout, but this is what the insides look like. If you've ever cut a dryer open, and inside is a brass screen, which contraps really the big contaminants. So this dryer would be for would be before the EXV or TXV, and it would do its job. Mike, what's a couple other abbreviations I'll see on there for TXVs or or EXVs? Um, TXV, you could see a flow rater. Back in the old days, you'll see a flow rater. Um, I gotta think about it for a minute. Um, you guys are looking at drawings, you're actually gonna see a TEV or an EEV. So it's the same components. So, okay. So TXV is, you'll see, you'll see both abbreviations. Just make sure that you know that you're looking at the same thing. So on the difference between TXVs and e EXVs, there's one's mechanical, one's electronic. So oh. it's going to use a driver board on an EEV, uh, and it's going to use a thermistor and a transducer most likely to be able to create the superheat and get those settings. And then a, a, a TXV or a TEV is going to be mechanical. It's going to be a pressure uh, uh, power head. So with, an inner, with a, a gas, and unlike gas in it, and then it's going to have the, the spring, the setting spring. So and it's gonna have the setting spring and the back pressure to push against the diaphragm pressure. So one opening, two closing. So keep, keep going, Jim. So here's the inside so, guts. And it shows the spring, just like Jim said, this is a mechanical TXV, there's your spring. If I actually pull the tops of that, there'd be some pins on the top, just like Jim was talking about. And here's the bottom piece of that valve with the stem down in the cap. What the benefits for using a, a uh, and why they're going a lot more to electronic expansion instead of thermostatic expansion is because guys, the stroke on the piston is a lot wider range. So they're able to, to do a lot more mass flow through that valve on an electronic expansion. So you notice a lot of the new types of cases and a lot of the new types of controls use electronic expansion, it's because of the amount of control and flow that they can use. They can flood that coil extremely fast and efficiently, but they can also throttle it back efficiently. So that's the difference. So when you're dealing with these newer cases, kind of like what we're seeing in the Mavericks and stuff with the beacon systems, the reason why they're going to electronic expansion, well, one, because of the types of refrigerants and the glides they're getting, but the, sec the, the most important thing is, you know, <clears throat> you're dealing with less than a 5 16th stroke on, a, on a, a thermostatic expansion valve, which is a very small tolerance. So you, you're getting a lot more out of your electronic expansion. You could, they can throttle those valves wide open to almost triple the time of a, a thermostatic expansion valve. So that, and they can throttle that rate at, at an exponential rate. So they're able to control those cases and get the efficiency and the heat transfer out of those cases a lot more quickly and efficiently with the new, with the new coils that they're bringing out to market. So that's why we're going to modulating uh, uh, electronic expansion is because it's a, it's more efficient and you can flood the coil 
a lot quicker and you can control it a lot more finite at the, at the case. So there's a huge energy saving than going to an EXV. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, and there, and there's a lot more control capability. So that's why they're moving to that. Uh, they're not just doing it because they like electronics. There's a lot more efficiencies and control that they can do. I know a lot of guys hate them in the field because when they break, they're a pain to troubleshoot, but that's the reason for, for bringing the uh, electronic expansion to the market. Awesome. See, I, we don't see it here just because we're on the air conditioning side. So it's a fantastic point. Thanks, Jim. A, a very common type of metering device is called a TX valve or a thermostatic expansion valve. This valve has the capability of controlling the refrigerant flow. If the load on the evaporator changes, the valve can respond to the change and increase or decrease the flow accordingly. The TXV has a sensing bulb attached to the outlet of the evaporator. The bulb senses the suction line temperature. Here's a bulb. Senses the suction line temperature and sends a signal to the TXV right there allowing it to adjust the flow rate. This is important because if not all, the refrigerant and the evaporator changes into a gas. There could be liquid refrigerant content returning to the compressor and this can be fatal to the compressor. Liquid cannot be compressed when a liquid compresses, uh, when a compressor tries to compress a liquid, mechanical failing can happen. The compressor can suffer mechanical damage in the valve's bearings, and this is called liquid slugging. Normally, TXVs are set to maintain at 10 degrees of superheat. This means that the gas returning to the compressor at least 10 degrees away from the risk of having any liquid. This is just kind of a dumb thing, but I've interviewed hundreds of techs, and one thing I ask is about superheat, and I had a tech tell me about five years ago, when I said, what is superheat? He said it was really hot heat. So, <laughs> really hot heat. So anyways, again, this is the expansion valve. But they talked about the sensing bulb, giving the signal to the power head. There's a gas inside here that matches the refrigerant, opens and closes, and allows refrigerant coming in and going out to maintain superheat. So to keep a flooded evaporator at the same time, preventing flood back to the compressor. You guys know that's on the line, that's all the managers and senior guys, that 10 isn't a really general term. So we're running Costco cases as low as four to six degrees. A lot of uh, the, the <clears throat> low profile coils at Maverick should be four degrees in the wow. beer cave and in the, in the freezer. So. You know, that's a very general term. Don't get stuck on that 10 degrees of superheat. So you need to look at your manufacturer setting and, and you can get that online anywhere and, and make sure that, you know, depending on the type of coil, evaporator coil you're working with and the type of case, um, every supermarket has their specs on their superheats and every manufacturer has their suggested spec on their superheats. So you really need to know how to dial in superheat because it's extremely important to the efficiency of that piece of equipment when you're working on it. Jim is 100% correct. They, I used to do a lot of work out at military bases out in the desert like Fort Irwin and 29 Palms, and they would put in Manurop compressors that had built-in accumulators, and we were running one to zero, one to zero degrees of superheat to keep those compressors cool at 120 degree divide. Uh, ambient, 118, 120 degrees. So Jim is 100% correct. Really know your system, know what the design ranges are, what the TXVs are set for, the cases are set for, and do not get stuck on that 10 degrees of superheat. You know, if anything we've learned guys lately is that those low profiles and those Mavericks that they're using, they want those at four degrees superheat. So if you learned anything today, hopefully that's not new information, but if it is, write that down. So they want those low those low pros running at four degrees. That's where they're that's where they're um, actually engineered to run. Hmm. Built-in accumulators as well on the condensers. Um, not all the time. So, but they're because they're, because of the way they're flooding those those coils and the way that they're designed. 
awesome. they want those they want those running up four. Great stuff. Thanks, Jim. The evaporator is where the heat is removed from your house, business, or refrigeration box. Low pressure liquid leaves the metering device and enters the evaporator. Usually a fan uh, will move warm air from the conditioned space across the evaporator fin coils. The cooler refrigerant and the evaporator tubes absorb the warm room air. The change of temperature causes the refrigerant to flash or boil and changes the low pressure liquid to a low pressure cool cold vapor. The low pressure vapor is pulled into the compressor and the cycle starts all over again. The amount of heat added to the liquid to make it saturated and change its state is called superheat. One way to charge a system with refrigerant is by superheat. So in air conditioning, we go to a lot of units that have the nameplate is gone and missing. Uh, older package units, older built up, especially when you're dealing with open drives and systems built like in Los Angeles, we'll see systems built in the 1960s, 1970s that'll run 5H60 open drive compressors or 5H40s. We don't know the charge, so we'll just go off the receiver, the sight glass, and charge the whole thing by superheat. Any questions about superheat? I'm hoping Jim's got something, because Jim is a wealth of knowledge sitting there. Well, I, I got a question from the HVAC side. So I was always taught from the low temp side that we actually check AC mostly by subcooling. Uh -huh. because of the because those compressors are built differently than the low temp correct and so w when we're dealing with anything high temp we usually try to look at that subcooling because that tells us that correct charge especially now with the high efficiency coils right so we're looking for, we're looking for that 10 to 12 degrees of subcooling right and then when we're anytime we're dealing with like medium and low temp we're actually looking for that that super heat check is, is that right mike have you heard that same or is that different that is correct so we'll do the two the problem is, is some guys will, will stare at the subcooling and they'll try to grab that 10 degrees and sometimes they'll overcharge it because they're not looking at the whole system and then they forget about superheat and then I've got a flood back issue. So, you know, when we go out to a unit, a, like a big package unit or a big built up or a box car, it's really important to look at the whole system. Just like in refrigeration, you look at the whole system, you look at the compressors, the oil, liquid level, sight glass, superheat, sub whatever it is, you look at the whole system. But guys, they get so focused on that, on that subcooling and they get, and I know it's in here further on, they get focused on the liquid line sight glass that they think that when they see vapor in it or bubbles in it, they're undercharged and they just keep pounding that refrigerant in. When sometimes that superheat and subcooling are telling you you're great, but you're gonna have some bubbles going by in your sight glass. It's just a new, you know, the way 410 works and 407C works. So does humidity on the load have it, any impact on superheat when you're dialing it in? Yes, I believe so, right, Jim? Because humidity is considered a heat load. Um, okay. Yeah, humidity has you should be able to you should be able to set your superheat at your valve wherever you need to set it. So usually you'll what you'll see with humidity is you, it'll condense. Shouldn't matter on your setting on your expansion valve. You should be able to set that expansion valve where you need to. Now as it goes through the cycle and picks up, it's gonna have it is gonna have more heat transfer, but it shouldn't dictate what what your setting should be at your TXV. So if you want to set up your superheat at your TXV and you know how to do that correctly and you want to get that into that 10 to 12 degrees, depending on, or, you know, eight or six or four, wherever you're setting it, all your humidity is going to, you're going to have a hard time getting uh, good cooling if you're over a certain percentage of humidity and heat. So, but um, usually if you're dealing with, you're in the case, you're in the store, it's not, it's 90% of the time you should be able to hit your setting and then watch what it happens. So all humidity is gonna do is, is uh, cause the moisture in the air to condense quicker on the coil. So it'll frost it more or it'll, it'll start to condense in the moisture on the coil, but you still should be able to set your superheat wherever you need to. So, you know, Mike's saying it, it affects it absolutely. There's, there's heat in that moisture. 
so and that heat transfers into the system so it's going to matter but as far as setting your superheat it shouldn't matter you should be able to set it mm -hmm. He's correct. Jim is correct again. Jim is right all the time. No, as a serious, I mean, he is correct because it will affect it. You may have a longer time reaching temperature because your evaporator and your moisture has reached dew point. And then you get to that point to where you're at, you've got water, a lot of condensate flowing out of your box. But Jim is correct about the superheat setting. What's that? If you don't mind, I'll chime in. One thing we may want to point out also is that when setting that superheat, we need to be at or near our box temp rather than, uh, you know, sitting on a warm box so that the uh, superheat is actually set correctly. Yes, great call. Thank you, <clears throat> Sean. So that's absolutely 100% what needs to happen, guys. You guys shouldn't be messing with the valve unless you're within 10 degrees of, of optimum performance temperature. So if you if you got a box that runs at a 34 degrees or a 32 degrees, I wouldn't even start getting on that valve until you're at 42 to 40 degrees. And then you can start slowly making your adjustments. And anytime we adjust an expansion valve, guys, we do it slowly, you know, an eighth to a quarter turn at a time. You adjust it, you hang out for a while. So if you're adjusting expansion valves, plan on camping out for a while to make sure that, you know, you see it throttle back and forth. You do those checks. I've watched guys that do the, you know, wind it all the way in, wind it out three full turns, watch it for about, you know, three to four minutes and call it good and walk away. Well, nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10, they're coming back. So if you guys get on an, get on an expansion valve and you start adjusting an expansion valve, you better call your, your uh, central operations or your service manager and let them know you're going to be there a while. So uh, nine times out of 10, guys will just end up changing the valve for this reason. But what I'm saying is the good technicians are patient and they sit there and they'll adjust and they'll wait and they'll watch and they'll adjust and they'll wait and they'll watch. And so you guys, if you, if you touch an expansion valve, plan on hanging out for a half hour. So if, and that's from the final adjustment. Once you make that final adjustment, you need to watch it. So make sure that your superheat's good. Make sure your superheat or your compressor is good. That compressor check tells us if we're getting, the, if it's coming hot back too hard to the compressor or, or not enough. Mm -hmm. So, I believe so you, you isn't there a there's a and I hate to say there's a rule of thumb, but I believe one turn on the stem on a TXV is like two to four degrees. Like you go one turn, it's gonna have a huge swing. If you just make some straight on, just swing it out and call it good. I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna say any of that any of those things that we've heard is ballpark because every, there's so many conditions determining superheat, humidity, heat load, piping. Um, refrigerant um, charge, uh, refrigerant type, that I would say, you know, that's that's possibly a good rule of thumb. But anytime you're making adjustments to TXVs or EPRs, you guys just need to understand, you need to be pay a patient technician at that point. Yeah. It's not hurrying and, and it's, there's a time to get in and get out. And there's a time if you if you put your service wrench on the backside of that TXV and you get you get on that adjustment, don't do it and then and go. Don't adjust and go. Make sure your make sure your clamps on the pipe. Make sure you're gauged up. Make sure that when you make that adjustment, you're making a very finite adjustment to the system that could affect the efficiency of that system, the the operating conditions of that system, uh, and that compressor on that system, which is the most usually the most expensive component there. So I would I, I say by all means make adjustments to expansion valves if you need to, but let's make let's take the time we need to to do it right. 100% correct. So great. Thank you, Jim, for that. Uh, refrigeration cycle recap uh, starts with the compressor. A low pressure vapor is compressed and discharged out the compressor. The refrigerant at this point is high temperature, high pressure, superheated vapor. The high pressure refrigerant flows to the condenser by the way of the discharge line. The condenser changes the high pressure refrigerant from a high pressure, or excuse me, high temperature vapor to a low temperature, high pressure liquid and leaves the look through the liquid line. The high pressure refrigerant then flows through a filter dryer to the thermal expansion valve or TXV. The TXV meters the correct amount of liquid refrigerant into the evaporator. As the TXV meters the refrigerant, 
a high pressure liquid changes to a low pressure, low temperature saturated liquid vapor. This saturated liquid vapor enters the evaporator and is changed to a low pressure dry vapor. The low pressure dry vapor is then returned to the compressor in the suction line and the system starts all over again. PT chart, R12. Man, R12 is the best gas ever made. Uh, when you are charging or checking a refrigerant unit, you set a, use a set of gauges. The blue hose connects to the port on the low side of the system and your red hose connect to the high side of the system. Um, for me personally, I use all black hoses, deep vacuum hoses or all yellow hoses. Um, so, you know, if you ever work with me, you're gonna be in trouble if you're looking for color-coded hoses. So really know your gauges. To properly know what your pressures and temperatures should be, you will need to know what refrigerant you are working with and a PT chart, pressure temperature chart is needed. With a PT chart, if you know the temperature or pressure of the ambient air or, or the refrigerant in your system, you can use a PT chart to convert it to equal pressure or temperature. For example, using the chart at the right, at 100 degrees, R22 pressure would be 198.4. At R502, another fabulous gas, at 100 degrees would be 218.6. R12, best gas ever, at 100 degrees would be 119.4 pounds pressure. If you know pressure, cross pressure on the chart to the corresponding temperature. If you guys have ever seen rapid recovery come out and rapid recovery comes out and cleans out bottles, if you've ever washed them, they will do a PT chart on every single tank so they know 100% what's inside that bottle. So that PT chart is, is a must have. We don't use them too much anymore, but you know, it's, it's really, it's most of it now is built into your Testos or your, uh, your S-Mans, it's all built into it. You guys, there's free apps. So this is a little bit dated slide, I guess, but um, there's, you know, you can use the PT Pro Emerson app. Bitzer makes an app for with the PT charts. So, and they update them with all the new refrigerants. So R290 is just on there. So if you guys don't have those loaded into your phone or your tablets, let us know. We'll, we'll push it onto the tablets if you want us to, a, a good PT chart. So, you know, give us some feedback on that. But yeah, I mean, anybody that ha keeps, a, we all have our phones on us. So I would just load one of those, one of those apps onto your phone. They're free. And then, and then you guys will always have a PT chart with you. And you can get the RSD app. The RSD app is a fantastic little app. It's free. Everybody buys from RSD anyways, but you can get that RSD app. It not only has your locations of where they're at, if you're traveling out of state or out of area, but it also has a PT chart built into the RSD app. So again, Jim is right. It's outdated. This is kind of outdated. R12, you know, there's not much out there on the R12. 502 is almost gone. Um, I'm old. That's why I tell everybody it's the best gas ever made. Um, but yeah, it's great, great stuff. A common method for checking or charging is by head pressure. Find the unit's design contem condenser temperature from the specs, add 30 degrees to the outside ambient, 70 degree outside air, you would add 30 degrees, that gives you about 100. Take your PT chart and see what the pressure crosses up to at 100 degrees using R22. At 100 degrees of R22, it equals 198.4, so you would charge your system up until your head pressure is close to 198.4. If the unit has high, a sight glass, you're gonna check it for bubbles. If it does have bubbles, add more refrigerant until it clears. Always charge refrigerant into the suction line as a vapor. This is done by keeping your refrigerant cylinder right side up. If your cylinder is on its side or upside down, you will be charging liquid refrigerant and could damage the compressor. If you're charging a cap tube system, charging by superheat is a good method. Check your unit specs, pick a desired superheat, 10 to 16. Obviously refrigeration is different. Add or subtract refrigerant until the unit superheat is achieved. The superheat is fixed at eight to 12 degrees in most 
residential air conditioning. Again, a very outdated slide. Um, the 30 degrees above ambient was really an old school way of doing it. The new units in R410 that's out there in the high efficiencies, you're gonna really have to dial in your charges. Um, on the site glass for air conditioning, when we use 410 and 407C, or you're doing a retrofit, maybe an R22 system to 421A, which is a really good drop-in blend. Uh, you're gonna use your refrigerant weight of 80% by volume. So that means that you may have some bubbles in the sight glass and you could be perfectly charged. Jim. Yeah, how do you know the difference between it if you're undercharged or overcharged if you're seeing bubbles? Because we're dealing with a lot of uh, blends now with with a pretty, uh, and they're getting worse on the glides, like the new stuff that's coming out, the 448s and stuff even have a, a bigger glide than even the 407 series. So what do we, what do you, how do you know the difference? What's a quick check down that we can do? I, I know what I do is I fill the pipe. So if I'm, if I'm uh, a little bit warmer than room temperature on that liquid line then, and I'm bubbling, then I'm probably low. If I'm hot to the touch, is hot, you know, if, uh, if hot or, or just a little bit less than the discharge that I'm not condensing and that way I'll still be bubbling because I'm not condensing. And so I'll see bubbles come across that side glass. So that's a quick check I do is I keep my two fingers on the back side of that liquid line as it's coming out of the condenser while I'm charging it. So if, if we're good, but again, very rarely do we do, do we do charging by head pressure anymore? We weigh in our charges, everything's mm -hmm. critically charged on the smaller equipment, even up to the, you know, 30 pound up to 30 to 50 pound remote systems. So any of our, so anything that we're, we're putting in at, at Mavericks or, or restaurants or the smaller formats, we need to be weighing in those charges guys and, and just kind of use our head pressure as a check down. So we should be checking that. That should just be one of the many things that we're checking. So we need to be checking what's coming back to the compressor when we get down to temp. So, so if you guys, if any of you guys have questions about, you know, the difference between, um, evaporator superheat and compressor superheat. We're going to cover that, but if you're out working in the field today, it's probably a good question to ask your manager how you make those checks because you know that's going to be a big deal on how we're charged, how how we're how we're metering, and how the system is running. So your hands are one of your best tools. Doing your quick checks on your tech method and filling those pipes is going to tell you a lot when you're charging and when you're running through your your uh, your 15 minute troubleshooting technique. So my son, Jim is right. My son is a chiller tech that works for NASA in Los Angeles. They were working on a system and the guys did not understand. And they overcharged the system by 60 pounds trying to charge the site glass. 60 pounds and it threw everything off, everything. But all those guys clear, cared about was that clear sight glass. And what Jim said was correct about setting your superheat on a hot box. All they knew is they had a really high superheat and they were going to pound refrigerant in and they overcharged by 60 pounds. So the sight glass is not always not a good indication of your charging method. Jim was correct about charging, you know, get with your service manager and talk about the multiple ways of charging. Honestly, for you beginner guys, you need to understand refrigerants. So if you can study anything right now, know your refrigerant you're dealing with. Know the difference between a, a blend and a pure refrigerant. So when you guys are dealing with these refrigerants, you you kind of get a, a knack for the characteristics you're dealing with because that's really one of the biggest co confusing and di most difficult things as a newer technician in this trade is it was hard when we were dealing with three and now we're dealing with 30 plus. So, and they all have different characteristics. So as you guys are out there and you're making the troubleshooting, you know, you need to understand what it means if you have a glide, if you have a blend. So ask those questions to us. Let us help you understand what you're dealing with so that when you're doing your troubleshootings and you're doing your check downs on your systems, you're really doing it a, a good service and we're making that system run more efficiently. As you guys start to work through those processes, especially every month we see a new flavor coming out from Honeywell or DuPont. And so we want to make sure that we're, we're talking to that, especially with the beginning class. So, you know, let's have those discussions in this beginning class when you guys see those things or if you have questions about some of the newer stuff. And if we don't know, we can circle back next week with the answers. Subcooling and superheat. I'm still staring at Jim being in San Francisco. How it's, it's amazing. Um, get the refrigerant saturation pressure temperature. 
Take a pressure reading of the liquid line leaving the condenser. The refrigerant saturation temperature is a pressure temperature. When the refrigerant is turning from a high pressure vapor into a high pressure liquid and giving up that heat at saturation pressure temperature, both liquid and vapor are the same temperature. You're then gonna convert your pressure to temperature using the PT chart. You're gonna take a temperature reading at leaving liquid line of the condenser. You're gonna compare both the saturated temperature and the leaving liquid line temperature, subtracting one for the other, and the difference is the amount of refrigerant has cooled past the saturation temperature. So, you know what, we really emphasize that. For, you, for me, a little rule of thumb that I do is I carry a black ink marker. I'll mark on the pipe if I'm using a small laser thermometer. So that way I'm always checking it for the same spot and I don't, I don't mess up and take it from someplace else or a little bit further away, a little bit closer back. I wanna be as accurate as possible. Measuring the evaporator superheat, you're gonna get a pressure reading of the suction line, leaving the evaporator to, to excuse me, to get the refrigerant saturation pressure temperature. Refrigerant saturation temperature is the pressure temperature when the refrigerant is turning from a low pressure liquid to a low pressure vapor. It's absorbing the heat, it's boiling off. At saturation pressure temperature, both liquid and vapor are the same temperature. You're gonna to convert to temperature with a PT chart, excuse me, convert pressure to temperature with a PT chart. If reading is obtained at the compressor, not at the evaporator line leaving, you may have to add a few pounds of pressure due to a pressure drop in the suction line. Compare both the saturation temperature, sorry, I'm getting some text messages, uh, the saturation temperature and leaving suction line temperature, subtracting one from the other. The difference is the amount of refrigerant gas is heated past the saturation point. So it's really important, Jim, I'm gonna want Jim to add some stuff about Maverick. We don't do Mavericks here in Phoenix. So you guys really on the Maverick side, I'm sure that there's some uh, superheat settings that I do not know about. Yeah, just what I said. I mean, all we're looking at is like, we had a lot of guys struggling with the low boys and them icing up. We had problems with them like partially icing. Um, as we've been digging into them, we come to find out what was shocking to a lot of guys is that they run such a low superheat for that coil. But so I just want to make sure I said that this morning. So the the one thing, guys, is what you what you really need to set your superheat if you're not u using a set of gauges and clamp with the clamps and the you're not using a smart set of gauges is you need all you need is a clamp or a basic K type style thermometer, a set of gauges. So in a PT chart and you sh and you and a service wrench and you and, and you should be able to set your superheat. So and that's the way a lot of us, you know, seasoned techs have done it. So I know that now that you have a lot of the new gauges that have all that connected to it with the the S mans and some of the um, the other brands that are out there, which is great. But I I really suggest that you guys learn how to do it without that stuff, just so that you understand you know, what superheat is. Superheat is measuring the amount of heat pickup we're getting through the evaporator. So, and that refrigerant continues to pick up heat, you know, as it moves through the lines. And so we need to, we need to, what we're measuring at the evaporator is how efficient that evaporator is running by how much heat it's absorbing through that um, heat transfer process of the evaporator. That's what that superheat is telling us, how efficient it is. And then as that, that refrigerant continues to move upstream to the compressor, we still need some heat transfer capability to be able to absorb the heat that the compressor is putting out. So that's why that superheat test at the compressor is important because it tells us how much heat transfer ability that refrigerant still has as it enters the compressor to absorb the heat in that compressor to keep that compressor running. They, you know, a lot of manufacturers will tell you superheat, uh, cool gas is what keeps compressors alive. That's right, but it's the adequate amount of superheat if you want to get technical about it. That, that's, uh, still in the refrigerant to continue to absorb the heat that, that the uh, compressors converting from the electrical side and, uh, through the motor windings and through the, the uh, point of compression. So that's why we need that measurement there. So your superheat should be anywhere from four to 12, uh, depending on the style and the application. 
at your um, evaporator and your superheat should be anywhere from 20 on the low temp side to 40 on the high temp side at your compressor. That's what you guys should be looking for. If you're in those ranges, we're probably going to be okay. If you drop below 20, you're probably getting a, giving that compressor a pretty hefty link, drink of liquid. So, and if you're running above 40, you're not giving it enough to absorb the heat of the compressor. So, if you guys have questions after this class about the basic superheat, like the basic building blocks of what we do, the last and final measurement that we can take is superheat or subcooling. So, that's the H and Tech method. So as you guys are doing your check downs and if you are having to gauge up, which I don't suggest every call because every time you gauge up, you have a potential to contaminate that equipment. So if we can do it without most of the time, that would be great. But if we do it, make sure we make it worth our while and, and we do and we set those things properly and get us on the phone and have those conversations with us. You know, another thing too, Jim, is that the, the new guys in the trade are using this thing called beer can cold or soda can cold or monster, whatever. That's, that is an old wives tale started by guys back even when I, before I started in the eighties, not the 1880s, but the 1980s. And you know what, that's beer can cold and stuff like that. I honestly had never heard of that ever on superheat until social media. So you guys that are, that are out there and you're seeing beer can cold, that's, that's not even true. So don't follow in those old wives' tales about superheat or those old wives' tales about subcooling. In today's system, you can't, you can't, you know, take shortcuts. You can't cheat the system and come up with a, a quick way. You've got to follow precisely. The customers are wanting energy savings. They're wanting their system to run. Warranties and guarantees are even tighter. So do the job right. Get with your service manager, and let's get you guys trained correctly. And that's why you're here, to get the training correctly. Saturation temperature, the temperature of a liquid vapor or a solid where if any heat is added or removed, there's a change of state takes place. A change of state transfers a large amount of energy. At te saturation temperature, materials are sensitive to additions or removal of heat. Water is an example of how saturation property of a material can transfer a large amount of heat. Refrigerants use the same principle as ice. For any given pressure, refrigerants have saturation temperature. If the pressure is low, the saturation temperature is low. If pressure is high, the saturation temperature is high. Latent heat is the heat required to change to a liquid to a gas or the heat that must be removed from a gas to condense it to a liquid without the change of temperature. Heat is a form of energy that is transferred from one object to another. Heat is a form of energy transferred by a difference in temperature. Heat transfer can occur when there is a temperature difference between one or two objects. Heat will only flow from a warm object to a colder object. Heat transfer is greatest when there's a large temperature difference between two objects. Um, this is just a real quick thing. You can actually see latent ha uh, heat happening when you watch ice melt. So that difference when it goes from ice to a liquid, right at that point, right if you like put ice in a glass of water and you begin to see it melt, that's actually latent heat. It's changing state with no change in temperature. Basic recaps, refrigerant is the removal of heat from a material space, that it is temperature is lower than that of the surroundings. When refrigerant absorbs the unwanted heat, this raises the refrigerant temperature or saturation temperature so that it changes from a liquid to a gas, it evaporates. The system then uses con condensation to release the heat and change the refrigerant back into a liquid. This is called latent heat. This cycle is based on the physical principle that a liquid extract heat from a surrounding area as it expands and boils into a gas. To accomplish this, the refrigerant is pumped through a closed loop pipe system. The closed loop pipe system stops the refrigerant becoming contaminated and controls its stream. The refrigerant will be both a vapor and a liquid in the loop.
Key terms to remember, BTUs, an air conditioner's capacity is measured in British thermal units, or BTUs, a BTU is amount of heat required to raise by one degree the temperature a pound of water. So if you buy an air conditioner rated at 10,000 BTUs, it has the ability to cool 10,000 pounds or about 1,200 gallons of water, one degree an hour. Refrigeration is usually measured in tons or 12,000 BTUs equals to one ton. Latent heat is the heat given up or absorbed by a substance as it changes in state. It is called latent heat because it is not associated with a change in temperature. Each substance has characteristic latent heat effusion, latent heat of vaporization, latent heat of condensation, and latent heat of sublimation. I don't even, what is sublimation, Jim? Uh, sublimation you would see in CO2. When something goes from a solid to a gas without going to a liquid, that's oh. sublimation. It skips a phase. So oh. like with water, water goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas or to a vapor. Like with a CO2, CO2 is where we'll see sublimation. CO2 goes directly from a solid, like a, block, a piece of dry ice, turns directly into a vapor. It never goes through the liquid stage in atmospheric pressure. Awesome. Didn't know that. Thank you. That's something to remember because we're getting into the CO2 systems. And I think, Jim, you're working on some CO2 certifications, correct? Oh, always. We're always working with the guys to get CO2 certified. So we got awesome. a, a, quite a few guys on, in the company that has CO2 certs, and we're, we're working with more to get them every day. Superheated vapor, refrigerant vapor is located, or excuse me, is heated above its saturation temperature. If a refrigerant is superheated, there is no liquid present. Superheat is an indication of how full vapor, evaporator is of a liquid refrigerant. Um, high superheat means the evaporator is empty. Low superheat means that the evaporator is full. If you guys have ever been around a boiler, this is just kind of dumb trivia, but if you ever see superheated steam and you're working in a boiler plant, superheated steam actually has no, you can't see it. It's clear and we used to check in superheated steam, we used to check in our boiler plant with a wooden stick and you'd wave this wooden stick around and if super, there was a superheated steam leak, it would cut the wooden stick in half. You wouldn't even see it, crazy stuff. Saturation temperature, also referred to as boiling point or condensing temperature. This is the temperature at which a refrigerant will change from a state, excuse me, will change state from a liquid to a vapor or vice versa. Sensible heat is heat that when added or removed causes a change in temperature, but not in a in state. Subcooling is a temperature below saturated pressure temperature. Subcooling is a measurement of how much liquid is in the condenser. In air conditioning, it is important to measure subcooling because the longer the liquid stays in the condenser, the greater the sensible visible heat loss. Low subcooling means that a condenser is empty. High subcooling means that the condenser is full. Overfilling the system increases pressure due to the liquid filling of a condenser that shows up as high subcooling. To, to move refrigerant from the condenser to the liquid line, it must be pushed down the liquid line to a metering device. If pressure drop occurs, again, metering device. If, the, to, um, if a pressure drop occurs in the liquid line and the refrigerant has no subcooling, the refrigerant will begin to vaporize, a change of state, from a liquid to a vapor before it reaches the metering device. So that's a huge one for us in air conditioning, understanding about the subcooling, because if you don't have subcooling, you don't have liquid, and you'll have a TXV that goes into a hunting process. Which is caused by adiabatic expansion. Boom, that right there between that. adiabatic and sublimation, once again proves my what I thought all along, that Jim is a fantastic refrigeration tech and manager. If you guys get a chance, if you guys ever get a chance to work with Jim, it's, it's, and I worked with Jim in Vegas. We did a job at Whole Foods. Um, we did an all night job. I fell asleep in a parking lot about three years ago. We did this job and it's uh, where, if you guys get a chance to work with Jim, it's a definite treat. Uh, if you have any questions, reach out to your service managers. This concludes today's topic. We got about six minutes left before we go into the Arizona group.
If you have any questions, talk to your service managers um, and uh, reach out to everybody around you. Real quick safety topic, because I'm a safety manager here. Tomorrow's gonna be Halloween, so as you guys are driving your vans around, make sure that you're watching for children in the streets. We don't wanna hit anybody. We don't want anybody injured. So please, please, please watch for kids tomorrow out on the streets in the neighborhoods and in the shopping centers where you guys are working today and tomorrow. Have a good day. Thanks, Mike. Hey, guys, just uh, as a reminder, uh, you can find these slides. I know a lot of the text was small, kind of hard to read. Um, you can find them on our website at coretechnical.com. That's K-O-R-E technical.com. They'll be in the beginner section. This is course one. Uh, we'll also, we've, we've recorded this class. We'll post this uh, up there in a few days as, after the video gets processed. So thanks, Mike, for teaching a great class. And uh, hope to see everybody uh, either tomorrow for our advanced class or uh, next week when we do beginner again on, on Tuesday of next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jim.